So, Acts uh, 6. Um, I've come to Acts 6 because I want to look at organization, and here you see it. What we find uh, in the days when the disciples are increasing in number, there is a complaint, as you may well be familiar, of the Hellenists against the Hebrews, meaning the Greek-speaking Jews who relocated from foreign countries to Jerusalem at Pentecost are complaining that there's a problem here as opposed to the Jerusalem Jews who have lived there all their lives. What is it? It is their widows are being neglected in the daily, in the daily distribution. So there is a daily distribution for the widows. They're cared for by the church, but some of them are getting missed. In particular, it seems to be a pattern that the Greek speaking widows are being missed. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. Um, which we don't necessarily need to get into, other than to say that there could be a lot of reasons for that. It implies, you know, racism, maybe classism, maybe, uh, you know, Jerusalem Jews are better than Jews born elsewhere in captivity, all that kind of stuff. Hopefully that's not it. Hopefully it's nothing but logistics. They speak another language that maybe not all the Jerusalem uh, Christians are that familiar with, that would be a second language to them rather than a native tongue. You know, if they've relocated and they've sold off foreign holdings and their, their widows are here now, you know, maybe not everybody knows them or knows who they are and knows where they live and that kind of thing. So there could be a lot of reasons from the dangerous to the mundane, you know, from, from the, the wrongdoing of some kind of a bias or prejudice to just plain logistics of, man, we didn't know, we didn't understand. Uh, you know, despite a good faith effort, it, it didn't happen. So all of these problems can be addressed. <laughs> Thankfully, there is a solution to this, which is organization that God has given in the second verse. The twelve meaning the apostles, summoned the full number and said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables, which is to be deacons. So they're going to appoint deacons. Um, and there's a distinction between that spiritual work of the apostles teaching the word, preaching the word, and the physical work of the deacons, which is nonetheless a spiritually driven thing that they're feeding the widows, right? So this is what they do. Uh, pick out seven husbands from among you of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom whom we will appoint to this duty. Meaning that they are the overseers of the matter, for example, in this case, of making sure that the widows are not neglected in the daily distribution. <clears throat> Whatever it takes for them to ensure that the widows are being fed. There are, as we noted in time past, Thousands of members, uh, many thousands of members, maybe seven, maybe ten, at least five, and the number's growing. Um, and so uh, seven individuals are not doing all of the work themselves. They clearly have oversight over the work. What, therefore, is to uh, establish, you know, maybe you would say accountability or to establish some kind of organization, some oversight, some supervision, basically somebody to make sure that this is actually being done and is being done well. Maybe you would say that's a manager. Whatever you want to call it, that's a deacon. Their, their work isn't strictly to do the physical things themselves. Their work, and the reason why they have to have uh, as he says, full of the spirit and of uh, wisdom in the thir third verse, it, you know, you don't need the spirit and wisdom for small engine repair, right? It's fine to do small engine repair, but that's not the point. The point is that these individuals are on the hook or they're accountable to ma make sure this is being done. They know what is important and they prioritize that and make sure that what is important is being attended to and is being taken care of. Whether they themselves do it or whether they delegate that is immaterial, frankly. 
uh, it really doesn't matter how they get it done in some sense, as long as it is being done and in the way that it's being done is within the bounds of full of the spirit and of wisdom. The apostles are saying this is not a thing that is an apostolic duty. It is important. They're not saying it's not important. They're saying that there are spiritual needs and there are also physical needs and they are both important and they both need to have attention and they both need to have oversight. So the elders have oversight of the spiritual work and the deacons have oversight of the physical work of the congregation. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the deaconing of the word. <laughs> I mean, that we're all servants. They're serving in literally uh, uh, physical ways, in the provision of the supplies for the widows, the deacons are. The apostles are serving by serving up the word of God for us to feast on. <laughs> so there's physical food and there's spiritual food. <laughs> um, now, the point of this is that there is organization. And the fifth verse said it was pleasing to all, meaning that they all accepted that this is a good idea, this is the way to do this. And they chose these men, all of whom have Greek names, whom they set before the apostles, who prayed and laid hands on them. So the apostles appoint the deacons. The people choose, you know, somebody who, who can handle this, who can be responsible, you know, who is trustworthy uh, with the spirit, who knows what the right priority is and makes that the priority. And the elders appoint that person. Uh, so they become, you know, accountable. They're an officer in this way. It has its effect in the seventh verse. The word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem with a great many of the priests becoming obedient to the faith. Which is an interesting thing. The priests, you know, haven't got an income. They haven't got lives, uh, uh, lands. So for them to obey the gospel is for them to give up their, you know, customary portions, their food that they get from the temple. Now they have, you know, a whole bunch of widows indeed, <laughs> um, if you will, among the priestly families for sure. And uh, they may be among the number of those who from the fifth chapter were, were receiving that, uh, or I'm sorry, from the fourth chapter, were receiving some of the need, the assistance for needy saints as, as the need may arise. So, all of that to say, the organization imposed by the apostles is the answer to this question in the second verse, or this, this uh, objection. It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. There, there are things that need to be done, is what it means, spiritual and physical. And it is right that they both have an appropriate emphasis, and they both have an appropriate priority. They are both um, important and it's not like, um, you know, it's not like a, a, a high school or a college, you know, where, you know, you ask the teacher what the most important class is, they'll say, mine. <laughs> All seven of your teachers think their class is your most important class. <laughs> Well, you can't make all seven of them the most important one, right? You have to pick one. It's not like that, because here, there's more than one of us. <laughs> and we can all participate, uh, if you will. Um, we really, literally, can all participate. If you have elders, will they oversee things? Yes, they oversee the spiritual order of the place. But one of the spiritual orders that they make is a separation between physical and spiritual. And then they appoint the deacons who now are overseeing the physical business, but they themselves are not numerous enough to take care of everything on their own. That tells us fairly plainly, I believe, that, well, they delegated. So when I say everybody can participate, I mean literally everybody can participate. If we had uh, deacons here and, you know, we we set somebody over doing something, whatever that might, uh, well, like, for example, this move of the building, for example, that person would have the authority to make assignments, <laughs> right? To, to parcel up the work and make assignments and say, you 
I think you can do this. And I'm sure that you would talk with them and they would be nice about it. And, you know, well, I can or I can't. And this is why or this is why not or whatever. But they would have full authority to assign that and spread it out and, you know, have the, you know, have the, the uh, directory in front of them, if you will, and, and make assignments for everybody that are appropriate for them. That's perfectly fine. In fact, that's good. That's probably the way it should be. That would be good. It's not um, that this is, you know, turnkey kind of set it and forget it or that, you know, that's somebody else's problem. Somebody else will deal with that, you know. Um, so I wanted to look, too, at the qualities that are uh, mentioned in Titus 1, for example, if you go there with me. Think about it this way. God has an organization in mind for reasons, of course. We find in Titus 1, verse 5, Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, monogamous, as children who believe, is not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. As an overseer or an elder must be God's steward, he must be above reproach, he must not be arrogant or quick-tempered, must not be given to wine or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound teaching, and also to rebuke those who contradict it, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party whose mouths must be stopped up, because they are upsetting whole families, teaching for shameful gain what they ought not. So this is the job of the elders, <laughs> the work of the elders. You know, the first thing here in Titus 1 at verse 5 that that, that I notice, and I, I admit, I have a dark sense of humor. If you didn't know already, I have a very dark sense of humor. Um, so pardon me, but if you will, but Titus 1, 5, you know, like if we had a map, there's, you know, like there's or a timeline, right? There's no, there's uh, no, nobody, nobody believes there's no Christians here. The next step would be there are Christians here. Somebody has preached the gospel. There are Christians here. The next step would be, you know, that's a congregation, maybe not as big a step, but there's now, a, there's a church, right? There's, there's Christians here. There's a church, right? So the next thing there is to put remains in order and appoint elders in every town, as I directed you, right? Then you got Acts chapter six, you've got the elders are appointing deacons, right? And the deacons are activating the saints in physical things where the elders are activating the saints in spiritual things and so on, right? So you need an evangelist to appoint elders. That's what this is saying. Um, but it's interesting when you look at the timeline, and I say dark sense of humor because I, I have this picture of the map, you know, as if you were going to a national park or something and, and they have the big line up there of every all the trail or wherever, you know, and the little arrow with you are here, you know, we are here at the, there are Christians here. There's no elders, but there's Christians. And that's not where we should be after however many years, right? That's the thing. You got to think about it. Uh, I say a dark sense of humor. I, I mean, I chuckle about it a little bit, but it's really, you know, it's really not good. Why would we be at Titus 1.5? Shouldn't we be past that? <laughs> uh, Titus, I left you in Crete to finish putting things in order and appoint elders. Like that's the very next step, and we're not past it. We're not to it. And it should be seen that way as a deficiency. It's not the New Testament order. It's not how they did things. Um, you know, in, when, when Paul arrives uh, at Ephesus, he finds some people there who believe in Jesus because of John the Baptist, you may recall. About nine men, I think it said, and they obeyed the gospel. Shortly after that, you have him writing to Timothy saying how to appoint elders from those men. So that started in Acts 19. In Acts 20, 
Timothy has appointed those elders because Paul can summon them to himself while he's traveling back through the same region. Uh, that's just how they did things. You, you don't really read about it being otherwise. Timothy's first letter is written when they didn't have elders, right when he left, giving instruction for how to do that. And Titus also is being told, I left you in Crete to put things in order and appoint elders. Because that's how you do this. That's how this is organized in God's way. Now, uh, if you think about it in terms of Acts 6, before we get back into Titus 1, if you think about it in terms of Acts chapter 6, you realize, well, what would have happened? What would have happened to that number or what would have happened to those people if they hadn't had the apostles step in and say, we need deacons? And what would have happened if they hadn't appointed deacons? And what would have happened if those deacons didn't do their job, did not see to it that the widows were being fed? You know, what if these seven men by themselves were charged with feeding, you know, the widows of a population of 10,000 people every day? By themselves, you think so? I don't. Clearly, they delegated. They clearly oversaw that work to figure out how do we get this done? Um, and, I, and I heard a brother talking about it, that did they go to the meat market every day and buy cuts or didn't they maybe buy an animal that, or a, a field of animals that they slaughtered for the purpose? Yeah, right. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense because that's the kind of thing that a, a, a manager would do, a thinker, a contractor, right? Somebody who's in business is going to think about what's the easiest way, the most expeditious way that makes sense, that's sustainable, that right? It makes sense. That's fine. And that's right. That's how they should be thinking. But what if that hadn't happened? What if, you know, what if the congregation thought, well, okay, so, you know, uh, Stephen's got it. <laughs> Nicholas has got it. You know, they'll let me know if I, you know, call me if you need me. Let me know how it turns out. You know, <laughs> no, <laughs> you can't do it that way. <laughs> Whether you got 10 people or 10,000 people, you can't do it that way. There's a lot that needs to be done. So that's the thing. What would happen to the church there? Well, I, you know, probably they would have had a rift. They'd have had a, a schism over meaningless things. Accusations of bias, accusations of racism, perhaps, uh, or classism or whatever else it might be. All the isms, I'm sure, would have been there, especially schisms. But um, for what? For nothing. Just for lack of imposition of rule, imposition of leadership. The vacuum of leadership, I guess, is the deal. That's not good for the churches, and it's not God's idea. It's not God's order. That's where Satan flourishes, because there is where there's confusion. There's lack of openness, and uh, the rationale for things is not known. The communication is not there. People are not aware of what's happening or why it is happening, who is doing it or why they are doing it or not doing it. That's what happens when you don't have elders and you don't have deacons. That's a very difficult problem to solve. So that's a thing to think about when it comes to organization. When we go over to Titus 1 again and we look at it, what does he have to do? Well, He's got to be above reproach, meaning he can't be somebody who's a, a you know an infamous criminal. He has to be monogamous, which is not the norm in Crete. <laughs> they are a Greek city-state. Those guys are polygamists. He has to have believing children, meaning he's got to have demonstrated that he knows how to teach somebody to obey the gospel. Not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. These children are not, you know... Living it up wild, trust fund babies, getting drunk every Friday, you know. Like, that's not the kind of children they are. They're, they're listening. They're paying attention. They're, they're living good, good, upright, moral lives. An overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach, not arrogant or quick-tempered, a drunkard, violent, or greedy for gain, right? So above reproach, meaning he's just not going to get into the fray. Not arrogant, meaning he, he doesn't take it personally, 
because you can't take it personally and be a good servant. Quick-tempered, uh, yeah, got to be slow to anger. That doesn't mean you never get angry, because I think that means you don't care, and you should care. But it should be a really long fuse. <laughs> a really long fuse before that happens. Drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, yeah, these are all things that are out of control. They're being controlled by something else. The drunkard is, is somebody controlled by substances. Uh, the violent is uh, controlled by hmm, ideas, politics, uh, you know, the temper. And greedy for gain, of course, is being controlled by the money. He's not that kind of person. Why? Because he's supposed to be interested in the spiritual well-being, well-being of the church. He's supposed to be able to appoint deacons appropriately. Uh, he's supposed to help them select who should come and teach here, who should be a teacher, who should not be a teacher. When someone else comes in and has a problem, or when the brethren have a problem and they go to the elder, this is what he's supposed to be like. He's above that fray. He's not going to get in a fight. He cannot be arrogant or quick-tempered. You certainly don't want him compromised by drugs or um, you know, corruption of money. Anything of this nature, um, violence, you know, the, the, the drunkard, violent, greedy for gain. I mean, what is, this is just, um, you know, it's like gangs or Congress. I mean, they're, they're basically the same. One has an army, uh, one has an official army, right? Um, but they're the, the triumvirate of power, Right? That's not what an elder is about. He's not about power. He's a servant. Hospitable, meaning kind to strangers. A lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Right. He wants what is good. He's kind to strangers. He uh, lives right. He has himself under control. Because that's the kind of person that you would ask hard questions or the kind of person you would want to arbitrate um, a disagreement between brethren. Moreover, the ninth verse tells us he must hold firm the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound teaching and also rebuke those who contradict it. Uh, some have said this means that he must be a public speaker who has um, perhaps a teaching degree or something of this nature, and that, that's just way off base. What it's saying is he has to be able to teach. That's why he has children who believe, because he taught them. But he has to hold firm the trustworthy word to give teaching and sound teaching or instruction in sound doctrine and to rebuke those who contradict the sound doctrine. This is what is meant by the ability to teach. Whether that's public or private uh, is no matter. The point is that he holds firm that word and when somebody attacks the word, they have to get through him first. And they're not going to. <laughs> That's how it is supposed to be. Because there are many insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, whose mouths must be stopped up. The 11th verse says, and I know they all say they must be silenced. No, 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 no. This is the word for plugging a hole. Their mouths must be stopped up, meaning the elder's job is to stick something in that guy's mouth. Stop him from talking. That's what they're supposed to do. When a person is insubordinate, empty talker, deceiver, a false teacher who does not hold the doctrine of Christ, the elder's job is to plug that mouth. Well, what does that mean? You're talking about physical assault? No, 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 not literal plugging people's mouths. We already said above, no quick temper, no arrogance, no violence. Self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. That's not somebody who's uh, into physical assault. What we mean is that person's not allowed to teach here. That person's not allowed to preach here. That person's not allowed to lead prayers here. That person's not allowed to be a member here. That's what we mean. They have no audience. They have no platform. You take the platform away. The elders do this. By sound teaching. So this is organization too. What happens when you don't have that is, well, 
You have to try to find somebody who has a lot of these, but maybe not all of these qualities, whenever there is a dispute or there is a disagreement, and it may not go as well as it would if you had a qualified elder in that situation. It usually doesn't, I will tell you from personal experience. <laughs> I have many times done the work of an elder and done a bad job of it because I am not, or was not at the time, a qualified elder. That's the thing. It gets done, maybe, and not well, if it gets done at all. You're going to have a lot of troubles from that. And so the devil has a heyday when there is nobody here to stop that junk. When we look at 1 Timothy 3, you can be turning to 1 Timothy 3 while I'll be turning the tape over. So I was 90 seconds early. First Timothy 3, we find the same thing about elders, so I will skip it. But the deacons in the 8th verse, likewise, must be dignified. What kind of persons did they put in charge to handle this delicate situation where bias could be charged? What kind of person can assign work to you who are not a deacon, who are not an elder, who are not qualified to be a deacon or an elder. You might be a young person, you might be a widow, whatever it is. The deacons must be dignified, not double-tongued, meaning they don't share information. They, they're, for one thing, they don't share information. They hold things privately, which they should. If they're going to a widow's home and feeding her, it's nobody's business what her house is like or not like, what she has or does not have. Right? But there's also the idea that they're not two-faced. They don't say one thing when they're working with somebody and then complain about them later. <laughs> Man, I hate working with that guy. Or, oh, we assign it to this fellow. That, that's never going to happen. You're going to need to follow up on that. Like, don't, don't do that. You don't treat brethren like that. <laughs> not, not addicted to much wine. Yeah, right? We don't need them to be driven by drugs either, not greedy for dishonest gain, again. Greasing the palm, right? When a person is actually there on what they call the last mile in communication speak. The last mile is the mile, the last mile is the mile from the, from the uh, uh, switch or the communications tower to your house. <laughs> That's the last mile. It's the hard part. When somebody's working on the last mile, there's lots of opportunity for tips, bribes, right? Extras, gifts, favors, right? All the kinds of things that corrupt. That's why he says what he does. They cannot be that kind of person greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Meaning that the conscience there is they know what they know. They know how important it is what they know. If you Sometimes um, if you uh, in the workforce are granted access, say security privileges or HR privileges to people's salary or performance or things of this nature, you are also typically given some kind of a training or some kind of a disclosure that you have to sign or something basically saying, I will not use this power for my own personal gain or divulge the secrets of others and open the company to lawsuit Right. You get it. You've been given something that isn't for everybody and you have to guard it. That's why he says what he does, a clear conscience. You know what you know. And so you're holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. You are um, uh, uh, administering it the same for everybody, regardless of the circumstance. And you are keeping those things where they belong with the individuals, not on the tongue. Let them also be tested first, and then let them serve as deacons if they prove blameless, just like the elders. Tested first, meaning they can't be new converts. They need to have had some time being Christians, being faithful, not 30 years. There's not even maybe three years between the time that Paul leaves 
Ephesus in the time that he summons the elders to him. But something. Their wives must be dignified, not slanderers, but um, teetotalers, faithful in all things. Let deacons be monogamous, managing their children and households well. Those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and great confidence in the faith in Christ. Yeah. If a person is serving in this way and they're helping other people do their work, well, they gain great confidence in the Lord, and that's good. They should. It says their wives must be dignified, not slanderers, sober-minded, because husbands and wives share information. Right, And this is the idea. She, with dignity or gravity, I think King James says, would not be sharing secrets or gossiping, letting this information out. She has to know his whereabouts, if you will. Maybe she even goes with him sometimes to do some of these things. But yes, monogamous, managing the children in the household well. That's just showing, you know, they know how to impose order. And they do so. Monogamy is also not a given in Ephesus. <laughs> not as bad as Crete, maybe, but it's not a given. So that's why he calls for it. All right, so these are the things that make for the persons who will be doing that kind of work. And you can see that um, needing these things, the things that they provide, the, the ability to uh, feed the poor to, to make sure that we discharge our uh, duties to keep up with incorporation, for example, has to be entrusted to somebody who has the right spiritual qualifications for whom they understand that this is an important matter. It needs to be dealt with appropriately, right? These are the things that you're seeing here. It's the organization that God has in mind and while there are things that we can do to try and uh, uh, try to make those things better, uh, you know, there are process improvements that we can make uh, in the, you know, maybe how often we meet as the men um, or, and, and we should, I'm not saying we shouldn't. And we can, you know, Maybe make sure that we have the, the statements in and that we print the statements and everybody has a copy of them or uh, that we have, you know, clear notes about what we talked about and decided and, or didn't decide or whatever else. And, and that that also gets printed and shared with the members. Those are all good ideas and they all help, but none of them are appointing elders and none of them are appointing deacons and they're none of them going to be good enough. They'll help. And they're worth doing, and we should do them. But they're not the same. The thing that will really help is, let's figure out how to accomplish this. Let's see, what is it going to take to be these things so that we can get, get that ball rolling, get the appointments made, so that we can move the way we're supposed to as a church? Uh, I think, too, as a side note on 1 Timothy 5, you, you know in the 17th, it said, let elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And the 18th makes it clear. The scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Uh, laborer deserves his wages is from Luke 10, um, where Jesus sends them out and says, you stay in the house that receives you while you're preaching and eat whatever they serve because the laborer deserves his wages. And the you shall not Muslim and Ox is from 1 Corinthians 9, where he's talking about payment for evangelists. Elders are also being paid. Now, the reason that I bring it up, and I say it's a bit of a side note, but I will say, people have to be able to afford to do this. But they have to be, they have to be able to serve in these capacities. The church needs these things in order to, to grow, in order to be you know, what, what we saw happening in Acts chapter 6, remember how that matter, um, remember how that matter ended in the seventh verse with the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. 
if we want the word of God to continue increasing and we want to see uh, spiritual growth, which I'm convinced will lead to numerical growth if there are people who want to know the truth, um, then we really have got to do things God's way. Uh, there's no reason really to think that it will turn out this way if you don't do it the way they did it. You're not going to get the same result. And that shouldn't be surprising, uh, if you will. This really is one of the most important things, so that's why I brought it forward. And we talk about organization. And don't take, you know, please don't get me wrong uh, as if I'm finding fault uh, with you or with the congregation. That's not the case. Uh, or if it is, I'm just as guilty as anybody and everybody else. <laughs> um if you, if you want to do that, that's fine, but we're all in this together. Uh, I'm not saying that somebody's done wrong or somebody's at fault or anything like that, but this or any of the other matters, these are just things we didn't know, and they're things that are not fair, right? It's not fair. You're throwing a fastball at a little leaguer, right? We are, if we are trying to do the work of elders, you know, we got 25 unqualified elders. If we're trying to do the work of the deacons. We got 25 unqualified deacons trying to do this. Yeah, we're the little leaguers. And Satan doesn't slow down. He's still going to throw the hard things at us, the difficult problems that beset the churches. Yeah, it's not fair. And we've suffered unjustly because of it. And you see the consequences of those things. that They come and bite us. You know, this thing with the, with the building or with the, uh, with the corporation, I didn't know. I don't think anybody knew we had an inkling that it needed to be renewed. And, but who knew? Who would have known? Well, we don't. Uh, if, the only thing that maybe would have made a difference would be if that had been uh, something that was being handled by deacons at the time and we still had deacons today, then maybe that would be in the notebooks or whatever that they hand off. It's on somebody's calendar. It's on somebody's, you know, reminders or something like that. That's the best that I can think of. But to find fault with anybody who's here, no. Uh, I didn't know. Why would you know? Uh, why, why would any of us know if we were not part of that process to begin with? Um, and I've never run a nonprofit. I don't know if you have, but I haven't. So I don't know. So don't take me wrong. I don't mean to be finding fault with anybody. I'm saying to you, brethren, though, we do have a clear pattern in Scripture, and we do have a clear outcome of that pattern, and so we should follow that, and then we can get that outcome too. At least that's what I think. That's what I believe. That my faith is in God and in his word, and he will deliver. You have to trust in the Lord. I mean, Israel's military strategy was neither, and this is what we mean. Let's do it God's way if we want to see God's results. So that's the thing to work on, I say. The thing to work on. Think about how can we accomplish these things? How can we appoint elders? Um, and how can we yeah, begin to organize in this way so that we'll see that kind of boom, if you will. The work of God can be very powerful in this way. And he has enabled us to do something, you know, at such a great, in such a great way. I mean, we, we have so much to be thankful for and the sacrifices of those that came before. And I realize that we're having to uh, vacate this premise, which nobody wants to do, but it does mean that we have the means to accomplish whatever is set before us, uh, which is different from the current situation. And that's good. So I give thanks to God on that regard and say, let's, Let's figure out how to get organized like this and get busy in that work so that we can see the outcomes that God wants. And I do appeal to you in the way of mercy in this regard. Um, you know, it's not uh, the case that God is just waiting to trip you up <laughs> or that he's got us, you know, dangling over a fire by a spider's web. You know, that. That's not what's going on. He wants us to do this. He's empowering us to do this. And 
He is glad, if you will, that we are holding the truth. There is a faithful church here that is not deterred by whatever has beset it, despite all of these problems and despite our relative inability to meet them. You know, even when you do have deacons and you do have elders, it's still earthen vessels, right? (laughs) The power is still God's when the church succeeds. The power is still in God's word. But so, you know, not to make too much out of that, if you will, but to say, yeah, let's do it God's way and understand that he is merciful and he wants us to succeed. He wants us to do this and he'll bless us. I, I trust him. There's no reason not to trust God. He's seen us this far. And then I think not for nothing. I think he intends to do something to make use of and to leverage that opportunity. Well, today, if you are not yet a Christian, become a Christian, that you might have forgiveness of sins, that you might be right with God, as we've been saying, he is merciful, and it's true. You're alive, you are uh, well and uh, well enough to be able to obey the gospel. We have uh, the ability to take you wherever is necessary, to to meet you, to study with you, um, that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, to uh, help in any way that we can So that you might be saved is the most important thing, period, without qualification. Your soul is the most important thing that there is. You need to be saved. And if you realize that need, we're glad to help you. If today as a Christian you have not lived right, repent, make things right with God in your prayers to him. As we are told in the scriptures, we make all of our requests to the Father through him. And the Father hears us based on your repentance, based on your penitent heart. But if you need our prayers, we're glad to pray with you and for you. None of us is above temptation. As we said before, this isn't about finding fault. Uh, It's about, you know, knowing what is right and doing that. Let's turn together and be strong together. If today we can help you with our prayers or if you need to obey the gospel, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.